Okay. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get started here. Oh. ago, I, uh, I started off a sermon series by talking about a Christmas present that Kim gave me. It was a uh, the two record deluxe edition of The Hobbit. Uh, not the full blown book, but the kids version of the animated movie, which eventually became an animated movie. And uh, to me it was the, the best story ever. Me and my siblings would sit around on the floor and listen to that over and over and over on the record player. It's 117 minutes long. And still to this day, I'm almost 45. And to this day, I still haven't memorized word for word. In fact, when I was in college, I had one of my friends test me with the book that goes along with it. If I could give it the entire thing, I did. Best story ever. We, we all have favorite stories. Now, we can move it to a, a biblical context. What's your favorite Bible story? Anybody? Ruth. Okay. Anybody else? Favorite? Esther. Esther? Yeah. My favorite Bible story is actually the story of Ehud, or who we often call Ehud. I think part of it has to do with the fact that he's left-handed, and I'm left-handed. And it's also an interesting story because he sticks a sword in a really fat king, and when you read the, uh, when you read the account of it, it's pretty messy. He also has to climb through a toilet to get out. So, <laughs> it's, a, it, it, it's an interesting story. To say the least. But the reason I ask is, uh, Jesus tells stories, and he tells lots of stories, and the parable that we are on now, outside of possibly the prodigal son, is the most well-known of Jesus' stories. And uh, <coughs> back I guess it's been almost three years ago now, did a sermon series on how we should live. And we spent seven weeks going over our parable. I have spent more time with the parable of the Good Samaritan than any other story that Jesus ever told. I think I read six books on it. There's a lot there. And so as I go back, and I actually wrote this lesson because all of these lessons were done fairly early on when I came to Lane. And so it was done before that. So I read through this lesson and I'm like, oh, there's so much more there <laughs> than, what is, <coughs> than what is on the paper. But at the end of the day, it boils down to the concept of it doesn't matter how the person ended up in the ditch. We are called to help. Underlying thought. So, who is my neighbor? The parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. So I'll tell you right now, 25 through 37, 12 verses. Took us seven weeks to go through it. There's a lot of stuff there. On one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, <coughs> with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. 
But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, <coughs> and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to that place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, and went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Initial observations, thoughts, before we dig into it? Anybody? Every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a priest. Okay, thank you. And so, yeah, that's one of the things. Yes, you have a priest, he is a Levite. Then you have another Levite. Chances are he works in the temple too. Because not everybody that worked in the temple was necessarily a priest. You had, if you will, auxiliary personnel that took care of stuff. Uh, everything from changing money to sweeping the floors. So yeah, they're connected, but they're two different people. But still at the same time, they're shepherds of the house of Israel. So they missed the point. Uh, in John 1, first John, yeah. chapter 3, uh, it says that it's about loving your brother. Yeah. And so I wonder, how does that compare to neighbor? Same thing. Same thing? Yeah. You, uh, it's not a, not your actual brother or your actual sister. You're 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 in humanity. Uh, you you have connections happen multiple ways. You have genetic connections. Your physical family, you know, your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, you know, your brothers in that situation you share the same parents. Uh, but you also have brothers and sisters in humanity. We are all we are all. Well, as Paul put it, as he was talking to the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers in Athens, uh, he quotes Epimenides, we're all God's offspring. Not that we're gods, but we're created in the image of God, and so we share that in common. And then those of us that are saved are children of God, and we are identified as children of God. And so in that situation, then we have spiritual siblings, which those are the others that are saved. In this situation, you're dealing with individuals that are brothers in humanity. <coughs> you know, we know that the guy that was going down, we probably know the guy that was going down the road that got beat up was a Jew. So to the priest and the Levite, he is not only a brother in humanity, but they share the same religion. They share the same culture. With the Samaritan, your brothers and sisters in humanity, even though they clash and they don't like each other. <laughs> but as, as, as Christians, to another Christian, they are our brother, they are our sister, or often on that I'll quote Carl Ketcher's side, uh, where God has a child, I have a brother or sister, is the explanation that I would give for it. So there's a responsibility there. I, I think he even goes so far as to say that if you don't love your brother, <coughs> yeah. you're not saved. You're not saved. <coughs> it's one of those things that if you don't love your brother, you are not living your faith. Or to go back to 1 John, you're not walking the way that Jesus walks. And if you're going to claim to be a follower of Jesus, you have to walk the way that Jesus walks. Uh, I would give the other example 
and this goes both ways, not only a connection in humanity that you're both humans, but in this case, actual brothers. What does God say to Cain? Where's your brother? So we're, 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 we're all connected. You know, culturally, genetic, you know, culturally, genetically, or physically, and then spiritually, if we happen to be Christians. Anybody else? Good question. All right, well, getting into the context, we are now shifting gears. Even though all of the parables are kingdom related, all about salvation, all the parable stories are about salvation, and salvation is directly linked to the kingdom, uh, there are other <coughs> categories that we put them in. So we transition from kingdom parables to discipleship parables. What is discipleship? Learning how to walk the way Jesus walked. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? How we interact with God will directly impact how we interact with other people. So if we have a right relationship with God, we are going to have a better relationship with other people. I've put it this way. This is something <coughs> that typically I bring up during premarital counseling. And I think the only one in here that I've done that with is, is, is Don over here. Uh, relationships are bidirectional. You have relationships that go this way, and you have relationships that go this way. So your relationship between you and God and your relationship between you and that other person, you cannot separate those two. It's impossible. So I tell people, and especially in the premarital context, if you want to have a good relationship with your spouse, you're going to have to have a good relationship with God. And if you want to have a good relationship with God, you're going to have to have a good relationship with your spouse. Because they're interconnected. And if there's a breakdown in one of those, which happens, you will not have, there's no such thing as a perfect relationship, but you're not going to have the best relationship possible. And so that's what you strive for. Simply stated, disciple is a learner. Jesus spent an intense period of three years teaching his disciples <coughs> to take his message to the world. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, of course, the Great Commission. <coughs> Discipleship, therefore, demands that we make disciples of all the nations. As previously noted, being a follower or disciple of Jesus means having our priorities worked out. For Jesus either wants first place in our lives or no place. Our relationship is a, a relationship with Christ is either of prime importance or no importance. It cannot be moderately important, to uh, paraphrase C.S. Lewis. It's one or the other. It's either important or it's not. It can't be kind of. It has to take the top priority. And so your relationship with God comes first, and in fact, when you look at it, in the hierarchy of relationships, and, and this one given specifically if you happen to be married, uh, we're given roles. So you have God, husband, wife, children, goes down that. Well, it's that way in all relationships. God is first, and then we have our relationship with each other, and then we ourselves are at the bottom of that hierarchy. Beyond the Sermon on the Mount, this parable is the most well-known of Jesus' teachings, and numerous volumes have been written concerning it. As I said when I did that sermon series, I think I read six or seven books. Now, were there duplicate ideas? Yes, there were. <coughs> but what I saw over the course of that is there are applications that we draw out that everybody, that all the commentators drew out, but there were some different ones. And I will say there were some even some downright weird ones. And one of the things you have to be careful of 
is that this parable is one of the favorite teaching tools of those that promote the social gospel. The idea that our primary responsibility as Christians is to meet the physical needs of others. Are we supposed to meet the physical needs of others? Sure, this parable is really clear on it. But the physical needs of others never outweighs the spiritual needs of others. Now, oftentimes, those two are connected, and rightfully so. And many times, we meet the spiritual needs of others in the process of meeting their physical needs. Help somebody with a meal, <coughs> clothing, a cool cup of water, all the different things that Scripture talks about. And you may have the opportunity to share with them. But that should never replace the sharing with them of the gospel. Because what does it matter if somebody is clothed, fed, housed, taken care of? And their final destination is hell. What good have we really done them? Oh, we've helped them for a day. But we haven't helped them for eternity. <coughs> At the heart of this story the idea, there is the idea that following God means bringing back all of God's world into peace. A truly radical idea if there ever was one. Peace with God and peace with your fellow man. If you have peace with God, chances are you're going to have a better opportunity to have peace with your fellow man. Luke spoke frequently about the humanitarian work in Jesus' life. It is significant that Luke, a physician, would be interested in the poor and downtrodden. This parable should touch the same strings of the heart, both those that are able to help and those that need help. Every year, and I'm not going to say who, but every year that I have been here at Lane Christian Church, this is, let me see if I count right. So this would be my 11th Christmas. Every year over Christmas, there is somebody here in the church that hands me a $100 bill. Comes up to me and says, do you know a family or an individual that could use some help? And then that person hands me a hundred dollar bill. You know, I've never had a year where I haven't been able to find somebody that needed the help. Jesus said the poor would always be with us. You're always going to have those that need help. And I'll tell you, it's one of the most moving things that I've ever experienced. And it happens every year. It's just no questions asked. I don't care who they are. Don't need to know who they are. Don't need to know what they're going to do with it. Here's $100 given to somebody. <coughs> and I think part of it is, is the fact that when we give and when we help others, that's reciprocal. We're blessed by it. We don't do it just to be blessed. That would have motive issues. But at the same time, we know that we're going to be blessed when we give. Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> we like to hear those stories. Um, they had a plate run. Uh-huh. And they, in one week, from Monday to Friday, they brought in $3,000. Yeah. yeah. Kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, $3,000 is a lot of money. I don't care who you are. Yeah. <laughs> and they were the guys in one of three different groups. Yep. It is. And those are kids. And the, yeah, and those are kids. Yep. <coughs> Anybody else before we move on? This parable is almost universally referred to as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Though its title, which actually was 
inserted generations later. That's the thing about scripture. You go through and you open your Bible and there's a heading before this text. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Yeah, just like your, uh, your chapter indicators and your uh, verse indicators, your uh, numeration there wasn't there in the original. All you typically had was at the beginning that line the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, the gospel according to Luke or John. Sometimes you didn't even have that. Sometimes that was a title that was just on a little tag stuck on the edge of it so you knew what it was. So we have the title given generations later, but it would have been viewed as a complete oxymoron in Jesus' day. If you were a Jew, a good Samaritan, whatever. Nowhere in the text is the Samaritan ever identified as being good. It was his actions <coughs> on behalf of the injured man that brought him this title. Because if you were a Jew, there is no such thing as a good Samaritan. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. I'm not talking that they disliked each other. I'm talking that they hated each other. In fact, it's not a stretch of the imagination to say that a Jew walking down the path, be he a priest or a Levite or just a regular Jew, seeing this, seeing, uh, this man laying on the ground, had that man happened to be a Samaritan, not only would they have ignored him, they probably would have finished the job. That's how much the Jews disliked the Samaritans. And the feeling was mutual. Because the Jews viewed themselves as God's chosen people. The Samaritans viewed themselves as God's chosen people. What's the difference between them? Simply stated, the Samaritans were the ones that didn't get hauled off into captivity. You know, the Assyrians come along, haul you off into captivity, the Babylonians come along, haul you off into captivity. Not every single person was hauled off. There was a remnant that was left, but there weren't very many of them. But what happens? You're a small community. How's your community going to survive? Well, you intermarry with those Gentiles around you, and you become, in the minds of the Jews, a separate race. So the Samaritans were viewed as half-breeds, <coughs> dogs. In fact, Jesus even uses that term. Now, is Jesus actually insulting them and calling them dogs? No, he's making another point, but that's kind of what, what, you, <coughs> what you tend to get out of it. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Do you think the, the priest and the Levite maybe thought that the injured person was not a Jew? You know, I don't know. Because my guess is, because it says they stripped him and left him there, so... Basically, he's lying naked in a ditch. Did they stop and inquire? No, it says they passed by on the other side. I don't think it would have mattered. Like I said, I joked around. Had they known he was a Samaritan, they probably would have finished the job. But I think in this case, it has more to do with the fact that they were just indifferent, regardless of who it was. But, no, I don't think there was a name tag around your neck going... I'm a Jew, or I'm a Samaritan. There's no yellow star of David, you know, tattooed on their skin. Do what? What was that? Oh, it reminds me of the story of the speeches, you know, Dr. Seuss. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that story. <laughs> the Gospel According to Dr. Seuss. Oh, it, it really, it really, yeah, it is. Oh, it's amazing when you read his stories if you look at them. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of biblical themes that, that underscore Dr. Seuss. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, when you look at it, 
Following the Babylonian captivity, many of the Jews who identified as being undesirable were left in the land of Israel, intermarried with the pagan Canaanites. And it was from these undesirables that the Samaritans came. Though they worshipped the same God and venerated the same Torah, because of their mixed blood, the Jews regarded them as nothing more than half-breeds and dogs. For Jesus to make a Samaritan a hero of a story was a cultural faux pas. You just don't do it. But then again, how often does Jesus do what we wouldn't do? So he's going to prove a point to them. We don't know when or on what occasion this parable was given, only that it was the result of a question posed by a lawyer. <coughs> who is my neighbor? A Jewish lawyer would have been one who was an expert in the law of Moses. Though many times the scribes, the Pharisees, and the teachers of the law were antagonistic towards Jesus, there's nothing in the text to indicate that there was any malicious intent in this question. When we look at the question, it appears to be a genuinely valid question. It wasn't that they were trying to set Jesus up. This wasn't one of those, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar moments where there's really no good answer. Because he said, yes, he's in trouble with the Jews. And if he says no, he's in trouble with the Romans. Now Jesus still got the best of them. Whose image is on the coin? Render Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Render to God what belongs to God. <laughs> the area where Jesus places this parable is a well-known one. A road descending from Jerusalem to Jericho. A particularly dangerous route to travel. And one known in that day and even this day as the way of blood. When I did the sermon series, I put a picture of it. An aerial picture. <coughs> this is a winding road that descends from Jerusalem to Jericho. What do we know about Jericho as a geographic location? It's one of the lowest places. Huh? It was the first place they came to when they crossed the Jordan. Yeah. Also, it is one of the geographically lowest places on the planet. So when you are going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, you are literally going down. And so you have the hills on each side of you. Great places for robbers, bandits to hide. There's still an issue today with bandits along that route. And so not a safe place to go. You would not travel by yourself. So what do we know about this guy that was injured, that was robbed? He wasn't the brightest crayon in the box. He made the decision to make that journey by himself. Should have been with somebody else. But he wasn't. Yeah, you, 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 you could have. You, you never know. Right. You know, you always, you always wonder about the backstory. What, what can we think about this guy? Well, apparently he wasn't the only one traveling there alone. Well, <laughs> but what we see is, there, there, there's one thing we have to be careful with. We have to be careful with what the Bible doesn't say. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Uh... When we have this man going down the road, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Yeah, he was there. Was there somebody else with him? Probably not because there's strength in numbers. Would you be attacked? Would you not? Uh, you have a priest, probably has an entourage with him. A Levite? Perhaps. Or it could have been that they're traveling together because Jesus doesn't give a gap. How long of a gap there was between them. But chances are the priest and the Levite had other people with them. 
Did the guy that was hurt? Don't know. Did the Samaritan? Quite possibly. Because most people in that day and age did not travel that road alone. But again, we don't know. They could have been traveling alone. And if they were, then, then they were all stupid. <coughs> Which could be. So you're saying that this is an actual story? I think it's an actual story. I think all of the parables, I mean, there are a few of the parables that Jesus tell that we see in secular literature, stories that he told that would have been known to other people. But I think most of the parables are actual real life events that Jesus is familiar with, that Jesus knows something about. And chances are, <coughs> they're stories that his listeners could have known something about. You know, the dumb guy going from Jerusalem to Jericho that got beat up. Hey, did you hear that story? Because I'm sure if it was real, I'm sure the news of it would have made the rounds. But we don't know. <coughs> the only thing we know about the parables is that they're not allegories. They're stories. Most of the time in Scripture, when you have something of an allegorical nature, it tells you that it's an allegory. We just got that going through the book of Galatians. Paul uses an allegory about Sarah and Hagar, and he tells you it's an allegory. Jesus doesn't do anything with that here. As for the two main characters in the story, one is identified, the other is not. We know that the one who was stopped, the one who stopped to help was the Samaritan. <coughs> the one who was injured, though not directly identified, most scholars identify him as being Jewish. Thoughts? Comments? Questions? Before we move on. Okay. We get into purpose and application the primary purpose of this parable is seen in Jesus' answer to the lawyer's question. Jesus wanted them to know about the universality of his message and the kingdom. Two great truths. There are more of them, but these are the two primary ones. Religion is much more than worship. And compassion can truly be seen through the character of one's actions. So the first part of that, religion is much more than worship. All too often we allow our religious lives to be satisfied by ritualism. Now wait a minute, where have we heard that one before? Oh, we just got done with the book of Galatians. Paul makes it clear. It's not about the ritual. You know, we can get so caught up in what we do in this building on Sunday morning that we miss the fact that 98% of living a Christian life happens outside of these doors. Oh yeah, we have our traditions, we have our rituals, we have our... <coughs> <coughs> we have what we call our, if you want to call them sacraments, don't necessarily like that word, uh, because it's used and abused. But we come together, and we celebrate the Lord's Supper every week. Most important part of our service What's the service exists for? For fellowship, the breaking of bread, apostles' doctrine. So we come together to, to pray together, to have communion together, to study the word of God together, to fellowship together. That's just a small, small portion of what we do. And if we limit it to just that, then we're missing the point. The priest and the Levite may have been on their way to or from the temple. Where they serve God. But Jesus is saying to us that sometimes our act of worship or ritual must give way to the here and now situations. Because we know the arguments that have been given back and forth about why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. They would have been unclean, especially if he was dead. <coughs> Jesus is basically saying, you priests, you Levites, you know better. There's provisions in the law for situations just like that. Will it make you unclean? Sure. Are you the only priest and Levite in Jerusalem? No, there are thousands of you. Do what you're supposed to do. 
The major difference between the Samaritan and the priest and the Levite is that the Samaritan had a compassionate heart. That's not to say the priest and the Levite weren't caring people <coughs> for their whole life. <coughs> We're dedicated to serving God. However, in our service, we must have proper focus. Sometimes it's more important for us to be a good neighbor than to take part in some religious rite or religious ceremony. What is primary and what is secondary? We live in a world, we talked about this quite a bit, I talked about it quite a bit in that sermon series. It's the greatest ailment to modern man. Or actually, what's the greatest ailment to humanity in particular? Apathy. And unfortunately, apathy is completely legal. There's nothing in the law that says you have to care about somebody else. And in that situation, Apathy can be lethal if you don't stop, if you don't help. <coughs> For several years, I was a first responder. Oh, you get calls. I worked multiple calls. A few of those calls were humorous. Others of those calls I wouldn't wish on anybody. But the only time that was the only time you stopped when those tones went off and you went down to the firehouse and got on the truck and went out. Was that the only time you stopped to help somebody? I don't know. If there was something that was happening along the side of the road, you stopped. I remember driving, we were driving back from Kim's parents back home to Idaho. We were driving across to Wyoming. It was snowing. The wind was blowing about 50 miles an hour. Horrible, horrible, horrible day. A trip that normally took six and a half hours took 12. We came up over the Continental Divide. You could see for about 14 miles over that ridge. We're going down that <laughs> Going down, coming off the divide. And I look up, and there is a Dodge Dakota doing cartwheels down the median. So what's the first thing that you do? You stop. You stop, you run across traffic to get to the guy. Did I think much about what was going on around me at that time? No, because that's what you're trained to do. Not everybody's trained that way. I wish everybody was to stop and help. Because I was the first person to get to the truck. Luckily, the guy was okay. Oh, he was bruised up a little bit. We got him out of the truck. But by the time I went back to the Jeep, I bet you there were 20 people there. It was cold out. We waited until the ambulance got there. That's how you're supposed to act. But oftentimes in our society, that's the exception. What would the world look like if we didn't stop and ask questions, if we just helped? Here's the scenario I put into play on that one. What if we didn't ask questions, we just stopped to help? <coughs> the last plague against Egypt. Death. We call it the angel of death, but the Bible doesn't actually call it an angel. How do you get around not dying that night? Huh? The blood on the door? You know, the funny thing was, death happening that night was God in action. The funny thing about it was God didn't stop to check to see if the people inside the house were worthy. He just saw the blood on the door and passed by. That's kind of the position we should take when it comes to helping other people. 
don't stop to check and see if they're worthy because none of us are. We just help. Now people ask, well, what if they take advantage of us? Well, do your due diligence, but you're not going to know the answer in every situation. People have asked me, when there's somebody asking for help, what do I do? And I said, well, I can't tell you what to do because I'm not you. But I will say this. If you feel a prompting whatsoever to help that person, probably a wise idea to help that person. Also, don't forget, and this is the real kicker in some of it, about how we treat other people and interact with other people. I want to be careful about it because that person might just be an angel. Entertaining angels unaware. And all this can go off in so many different, you know, so many different instances and directions. Uh, the bulk of our benevolence, now we, here at church, we take care of our in-house stuff in-house. If there is a need we're made aware of, it, we help. Uh, but we also support the Ministerial Association. And there's a benevolence fund there. And it's run through the Neighborhood Care Center. And when people come in and ask for help, we're there to help them. But you, <coughs> you do your due diligence. Because are there people that will use and abuse the system? Yes. But at the end of the day, if someone says, well, I don't help because I'm afraid they're going to abuse it, that's between them and God. We're called to help. What they do with it, that's their own accord. And that's their own responsibility. We have ours, they have theirs. Unfortunately, in our world, we have abdicated to the government that which is the responsibility of the church in many situations. And there's also, you hate to see it, but it's true, places where when it was abdicated to the government, the government decided that nobody else should do it. Uh, I have a, a, a friend of mine that preaches down in Arizona, and their church provided lunch five days a week at the church building for anybody who wanted to come. <clears throat> and guess what happened? The city council decided that that wasn't a good idea. And so they sent the health department in to shut them down, even though they had food handlers licenses and all of this stuff. Why? Because the government couldn't control it. So be careful what you do. Just a little side note. Anybody else? Thoughts? Comments? Questions? Before we wrap up here? <coughs> All right. So, here's how it's going to go. We do not have Sunday school for the next two Sundays. Because it's Christmas and New Year's. So, we'll see you the second week of January. Huh? It's just the way that it falls. Just the way that the schedule happens to fall. Normally we miss one week <coughs> during this time of year, but this time it's two.